gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our next panel, moderated by Chief Master Sergeant Maribeth Ferrer, the Command Chief of the Air Force Sustainment Center, Tinker Air Force Base. Our panelists include Chief Master Sergeant Robert Barrier, Senior Enlisted Leader to the Deputy Chief of Staff for Logistics, Engineering and Force Protection at Headquarters Air Force, Chief Master Sergeant Cameron Davis, the Command Chief of the 314th Airlift Wing at Little Rock Air Force Base, and Chief Master Sergeant Daniel Guzman, the Command Chief of the 673rd Air Base Wing at Joint Base Elmendorf-Richardson. Please welcome our Chief Master Sergeant Fair and her panelists. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. So I know today's the last day of the symposium, but I'm telling you, we keep delivering these hard-hitting lineups for you today. So thank you so much for sticking around with us today. Again, I'm Beth Ferrer from the Air Force Sustainment Center. You're <laughs> I saw the boss, so I had to do that. Um, and so today, it's, it, mind you, we have to follow uh, the fireside chat of three iconic three-star generals, right? And so that's not an easy feat. And the only way we can do that is then delivering you some remarkable chief master sergeants in the panel today. And I tell you, uh, in front of you right now is about 80 plus years combined oh, of experience. About 600% VA rating. <laughs> yeah. so, so take notes. Um, and so I know you're not here to hear, you know, you're not here to hear from me. Uh, I did my part. In fact, I'm really more comfortable now on this side of the chair because grilling chiefs is far much better job than being grilled on the other side. Um, and so I know you're all looking forward to hear the senior enlisted leaders' perspective of these chiefs when it comes to their, or how they impact um, the uh, logistics readiness, sustainment, and our this year's theme of integrated deterrence. And so, without further ado, um, welcome, chiefs. I know our audience once again is so excited to hear from you. And so, we'll level the stage by first doing some introduction. Um, so we'll start with Chief Barrier. All right. So I didn't know we were going to start with like personal attacks about how old we are. <laughs> yeah. um, so, that was yeah. a surprise. <laughs> but uh, since I was fortunate enough to, to be up here uh, earlier in the week, I don't, you know, really want to go into introduction. But what I do want to do is, uh, you know, thank Colonel Kalen and the LOA team, you know, for for putting this together. I know it's a it's a massive lift to get as many people here that are participating, and it's it's not lost on us by the number of, you know, total force airmen, you know, guard reserve. Uh, industry, you know, our civilians, our, our allies and partners. Um, it's, it's, it's huge. This is a, I know we got a lot of competing priorities at home, so definitely appreciate that. And the other part is, you know, I, I was here last year for about a day, um, and I was really surprised at the number of enlisted folks we had. And, and again, this year, we've got a lot of enlisted participation and a lot of junior enlisted participation. So again, to the, to the command teams that, you know, these things aren't cheap, so that they prioritize that against other competing, author competing requirements and put a lot of value on their folks attending here, you know, that, that's huge. And my ask is to those enlisted folks, when you go back to your home stations, you know, share what you learned here. You know, there's a huge opportunity for return on investment. Um, and really encourage your folks to come next year um, when this thing moves to Dallas. Um, again, lots of goodness comes out of these opportunities, and it's been a, an awesome week uh, to this point. So um, I'll just offer it over to, the, to, to Chief Davis. Yeah, thanks. Uh, no one really, I, I think, wants to hear me talk about myself. Uh, so I just want to say I'm uh, honored and uh, humbled that uh, the folks reached out to me. I was really surprised when they said, hey, you want to come to Loa and, and sit on a panel? I was like, wow, that's brave to have a port dog sit up here uh, and talk. Uh, so shout out uh, to the port dogs and maintainers and everybody uh, in the logistics community. Uh, what you all do. Yeah, you know, clap. Yeah, uh, what, what you all do uh, really matters, and in the circles that I've been in uh, for the last a, a lot of years, since I'm old, um, uh, it's mostly been uh, working for pilots. Uh, and what I try to communicate to them is that without you all, uh, it doesn't matter, because we can't fight without stuff, right? And you all get the stuff. So I I'm honored uh, to be here with you all today. Uh, so thanks. Oop. 
All right, yeah. so this is uh, my first LOA, and uh, this is phenomenal. Just the opportunity to come out here and connect and reconnect with my logistics community, uh, with my Stoop Soup family. Um, damn right. Damn right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just great to come back, and uh, it's, I feel like I'm back. Uh, the other day I was talking to one of my old LRS commanders, uh, Colonel Blecker, he's here somewhere, and I feel like I was back at a LRS staff meeting at the 48th uh, LRS back at Lake and Heath. It was great just to catch up, to reconnect, uh, to walk the halls, and just to interact with the community. Uh, just phenomenal opportunity. Um, logisticians make it happen, so it's always great to come back home and uh, hang out with the greatness that logistics, logistics brings to the fight. Yep. That's awesome. So we'll just keep bringing the heat. And let me tell you, they're being modest now because I was surprised of how short their introduction was. But I was prepared to remind them that once you get the knife hand, as chiefs do, you're done. You got to cut you off, all right? So with that, given this year's theme, I know the audience will be very interested in understanding your senior leader perspective on how important, uh, the importance of integrated deterrence and really the criticality of it. And so we would like to hear from you all. Um, and with that, we'll start with Chief Barrier again. All right, thanks. So uh, for, for the folks who were here yesterday, I think you know General Dornhofer on the Women in Defense uh, panel pretty much provided the, the best example of integrated deterrence and, and where it's gonna go. Um, you know, and, and essentially it's the sum of the parts, right? Us and our allies moving towards that, that common goal and, you know, really generating combat power to deter, you know, all threats, right? Um, I, I think for me the, the criticality piece is what, what our logisticians bring to the fight. Um, it's, it's not lost on me. The importance of what we do is big L logisticians when it comes to integrated deterrence. Um, to me, I, I kind of think of the, the integrated deterrence piece as like this big giant tapestry, right? And if you, you pull on one string, the whole thing's gonna fall apart. Um, but the underpinning of that is, you know, we're that string. Then um, we've been it the entire time. I think with things like the contested logistics TTX and, you know, things that have come out of OIs five and seven, you know, we're really bringing, you know, what our big L logisticians bring to the fight. Um, and it's not one of those, you know, just, oh, by the way, we're doing it. You know, for the first time in a long time, we're looking really hard at things like logistics IT and logistics intelligence and, you know, how are we innovating and, you know, how are we acquiring new, you know, technologies in our organic industrial base and our defense industrial base. And it, it's the sum of those parts that, that, you know, keep that theme for integrated deterrence going. Um, I'm really fortunate in the seat I get to sit. Um, you know, I get kind of like that strategic perspective on, on how the sausage is made. And it's really enlightening to see the strategic thinkers that we have and the, the subject matter experts that are informing what integrated deterrence is gonna look like in the future, especially if the, the deterrence has to transition from, you know, offense to defense or away from deterrence as a whole. So I think we're in a, a really good place. And, and again, as far as the criticality of it, I think our A4s and how they're connected with us, our partners, are, are the, the thing that's gonna make it you know, beneficial for the, the DOD as a whole. That's wonderful. Chief Davis, what okay. I think what's important to understand when we talk about uh, integrated deterrence is that it's a, a continuous process that happens all the time. Uh, and then when the balloon goes up and when ordered to execute what uh, the President of the United States wants us to do, is that we employ uh, logistics forces to put combat power where we want, when we want, how we want to do it. And our NCOs and our airmen have developed relationships, especially at like overseas bases, to be able to teach the things that they've learned with our international partners uh, to get that combat power where we want it. A and is equally important with our um, partners in industry to be able to get the things that we need in the supply chain where we need it and how we need to do it. Um, a lot of times, especially in the 314th, we are an international schoolhouse in the C-130J FTU, and, and we employ that uh, platform across the world and across our DOD partners. So it, it's important to understand that the NCOs who are leading airmen uh, can do things, uh, especially in the United States, that no one else can do, and I'm extremely proud to be a part of it. And we, and and, and that is a deterrent uh, that we can do that nobody else can do, and it's because of, uh, of people like you. So uh, that's my take on it, and we do it every single day. And I know that the people who look at us, who are our um, competitors, uh, know that that's a challenge that they're going to have to face. And I think they're working on it every day, and we need to continue to pursue it. 
uh, consistently. Yeah. Well done. I think Cam nailed it. Um, we have empowered NCOs. We have an empowered senior NCO core. Uh, we're creative, we're critical thinkers, and, uh, and we bring things to the fight that are a lot of our potential adversaries that just don't trust their NCO core, yeah. the things we trust our NCOs with, for sure. Um, getting ourselves a rep, our, and reps in the Pacific, uh, like I know in Jaybird that's big on our forefront is exercising in the Pacific theater uh, and getting those sets and reps and building confident and, and competent NCOs and, and CGOs that are gonna be leading formations across that yeah. theater. Uh, so we gotta stay on top of it. That, that makes our adversaries look out the window and say, not today. Yeah. These guys are competent, they're confident, they're empowered, they're critical thinkers, and we're not up to snuff yet. So we'll keep uh, resetting the clock and going back and saying, not today, maybe tomorrow, maybe not. Uh, but that's gonna be the key, is sets and reps, uh, and just putting the notice out there that we're ready, and we're gonna remain ready, and we're gonna sustain, and we're gonna keep refining our processes, working on our folks, yeah. building confident and competent NCOs and CGOs that are gonna be leading formations. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah, you said it best. Air, our airmen are our competitive edge, and so highlighting them in that regard and continuing to develop and empower them is the deterrent in itself. So I love it, Chiefs. All right, let's keep this going. Our leaders of the Headquarters Air Force continue to emphasize that now more than ever, our collaboration with our allies and our partners is essential in our ongoing efforts to deter and defeat great power competition. Chief Barrier, I'll, I'll throw this at you. Can you shed some light um, to your current role now at the Headquarters A4 on what the lines of efforts that you um, think support and fortify this goal? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, again, had the opportunity to talk a little bit, you know, earlier in the week, and one of the things that we highlighted, you know, were the, the exercises and the opportunities with our, our allies and joint partners and, you know, kind of what are we trying to do to remove, you know, policy or guidance that serves in an, uh, as an un unintended barrier, like no pun intended, right? Uh, an, un <laughs> an unintended barrier uh, for us to achieving a common success. And, and, I, and I think that's one of the big takeaways for us is we have these common goals and we are working towards the same things, but you know, for us, we have to address the issues that are slowing us down. So with you know, all things you know, GPC for the last seven or eight months and you know, we're really looking hard at you know, how we organize and you know, how we fight by design, I, I think it's the, the awesome opportunity to where we can address you know, not, not necessarily integrated by design, but allies by design. And that goes back to, you know, how do we develop our doctrine? How do we look at our organizational constructs? You know, how do we train our airmen? You know, is there a, a common platform for sharing of materials and resources? And, you know, everything under the umbrella when it comes to, you know, us, you know, spinning up and, and taking on that next threat. Um, but, it, you know, and, and kind of as far as like, you know, the A4 is concerned and, you know, mentioned like the GPC stuff, you know, that's definitely been on the forefront for, for our teams, you know, going back to October. But, you know, kind of running parallel to that, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, our teams have been getting after, our teams in all of the A4s have been getting after the, you know, again, the set, the theaters, the con log, you know, OIs five and seven, um, basing logistics enterprise strategy. And in working all of those things concurrently, it's not just gonna benefit, you know, us as an Air Force, you know, it's gonna help us reshape and you know, fortify what we do with our allies and partners. And again, it, it's exciting to see the, the, the speed and velocity in which these changes are happening and how they're gonna impact our force moving forward. So again, I know that was a lot, and it's like a mini soapbox that I had to hop off, but I did get the barrier pun in there, you know, <laughs> if anyone's yeah. keeping score, so. <laughs> that was very clever, honestly. So for my command chiefs, um, two command chiefs here in the panel, Chief Davis and Chief Guzman, in your role currently, despite two different paths that you've yeah. taken, right? Cross air transportation, functional managers, material management, and even first sergeant duty, um, Gus. What current and future line of efforts do you see being explored in your wings and in your installations yeah. that help get after integrated deterrence? Yeah, that's a great question. And when you think about the 314th, uh, the challenge of what we have is we have an FTU, and so we have instruct, uh, instructors, and what we produce is widgets, and those are pilots and loadmasters in the C-130J, uh, that covers the integrated deterrence feature of like our international partners, right? So what can happen is a mindset of, hey, all we do is we produce widgets. So don't mess with it, don't change anything. We produce widgets, we generate a six turn four pattern, we produce this many pilots and this many loadmasters, so leave it alone. The, the problem with that is, is you have to think about what our competitors are trying to do, what could change that, right? So what threats do we have to the pipeline? 
And then so what me and Colonel Tucker, my boss, uh, do every day is we ask what if questions. What if the battle space changed? Uh, what would we do in the syllabus differently? And so we're always throwing challenges uh, at our team to say, how could we do it faster? What would we change? What does the customer want? What should we change in doing these kind of things um, to keep them thinking differently? Because as we know, uh, maybe not most of you, but us old people uh, were wearing the uniform during September 11th and everything changed. And part of what our problem was back then is we lacked um, imagination. We never thought that um, in the United States of America, commercial airplanes would be hijacked, one, two, used as uh, weapons. weapons, right? Mm -hmm. So we are always thinking about what could potentially happen and what would we do in the 314th to do it differently, to continue to execute our mission. What about a coup plan? What if we couldn't be at Little Rock and Purdue students? What if we had to fly away and do it somewhere else? What would that look like? And it is a little bit annoying to our team, to be honest. They're like, knock it off. It's going to be fine. Little Rock's going to be here. But we challenge it and integrate some exercises and things that they're not expecting to be able to do that. Uh, fly away and train students at somewhere else. We did it in Mississippi last summer. So those are some things that we're doing to challenge the team, to have them think outside the box while still producing uh, world-class C-130 pilots and loadmasters. Awesome. So Team Jaber, uh, our big push is the third expeditionary uh, wing. So we combine our third wing uh, with our third wing teammates. You know, they have ops and maintenance. Ooh. Somebody's clapping for that. That's awesome. Yeah, good job. Uh, good job. Yeah, wait till I get going here. And then we combine the 673rd <laughs> Airbase wing. Wait for the end. <laughs> it's going to get better. And then the 673rd Airbase wing, which is the, in essence, the garrison wing, the support echelon. We deploy together. We fight together as a team in the Pacific. Uh, next month, I'm excited. We get to do our uh, big exercise, uh, Agile Reaper. So we get to uh, exercise our hub and spoke function throughout the Pacific and, uh, and put people on notice that we're here to kick butt and take names. Uh, so I look forward to that. So every time we have these Agile Reaper or any kind of exercise iteration, we add more variables to it. We make it more difficult, like Cam was mentioning. We want to keep people uh, not guessing, but we want to keep them uncomfortable and keep them growing. We're going to keep refining how we do things. We're going to keep pushing the envelope uh, and testing different variables and different things and, and just to see how folks react, uh, how creative they can be, uh, and how, do, how are they going to react with, you know, this is not the same war that we've been fighting in the past. We're not going to... Uh, a set base, like no knock, but IUD is not going to be IUD. We're not going to have Wi-Fi. We're not going to have the pool. Uh, it's going to be a little bit tougher, uh, and it's going to come with some attrition too, and some losses yeah. and casualties, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But uh, we want to get folks in that mindset of, hey, it's not going to be what you grew up watching on TV, or where you. It's not going to be my previous deployments that I went on for sure. Uh, we have that going on. Also, um, education and training. Just last year, we had the opportunity to send one of our senior enlisted leaders to the New Zealand uh, Chief Warrant Officers course. Uh, so he had to go to New Zealand PME for roughly three months. It was an eye-opening opportunity for him uh, to kind of see how our allies in the Pacific uh, train and, and invest in their enlisted corps. Uh, and it opens those avenues, those you know, different ways of thinking, different ways and approaches to solve problems from their perspective. We're gonna fight uh, with our teammates. We're gonna, they're gonna, we're gonna join arms with them in the Pacific if it comes to that. So might as well train together and get comfortable with operating one another. Uh, so we're doing everything we can to get after. And we host Red Flag every summer. Mm -hmm. Last year we had the Japanese Air Force come and join us. We got to connect and work with those folks. Uh, so we're not gonna wait for things to go sideways to start building bridges. We're doing it upfront early and often. And we're exercising in our theater early and often. In addition to doing our Arctic Courses that we do here at Jaber, we host uh, last year, I got to participate in the Arctic Skills Training course, earn my Arctic tab, spend the night in the snow hole <laughs> in the back side of the fort, in the back side of the base. But it was great. I mean, it builds confidence in operating in that harsh environment in the Arctic. And I saw what it did for our young officers and airmen to go through it. I want to go through it myself and experience it. And it was phenomenal. So it's nonstop uh, at Jaber. Love we'll, to hear that. We'll go ahead and clap now. I mean, that, that's, 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 that's. <laughs> well, one of the things I'll add is, you know, you know, Guzman, he he really hit the nail on the head. Like, you know, and, and then General Minahan mentioned it as well with uh, Mobile Guardian. Yeah. You know, the fact that we're participating in exercises where we don't have predetermined outcomes, like we're allowing our folks to fail. To fail. Yes. Um, and we're allowing them to learn those valuable lessons when they fail, um, because again, you know. Getting 100% on every single practice test is great, yep. but you know what do we learn from that, right? Yeah, I mean, we are awesome. Yep. We, can, we can pat ourselves on the back all day long, but you know, really commend the commanders in the field for, you know, throwing hard exercises at our folks and really challenging the skill sets that they have because 
that, that's going to be it. We're, we're not going to be there to walk them through it. So really empowering you know, your personnel to make sure that they're going equipped with the skills and the resiliency that they need. Because again, the, the challenges won't be the same. They won't. It's not going to be a steady state requirement. It's, it's going to be different for our folks, and they need to be able to understand what that looks like. So I think Absolutely. that's awesome. We just got done with Bamboo Eagle, and Colonel James and Jenks came back and told us, like, hey, we, we got our clocks clean in some faces, and we wanted that. We wanted people to get tested, and we want to see how they react, and we want to see how they overcome. Uh, the goal is not to be <laughs> flawless and perfect. You're not learning anything. Yep. You, know, you want it to that's be right. a tough you know, situation, and want to see how they overcome and react, mm -hmm. yeah. or react and overcome. I tell you what, I'm excited to hear these words from these chiefs. I feel like these are the right leaders that we need during this time, right? Uh, so I'm just grateful and proud to have you at the leadership roles. I'll give you 10 bucks afterwards for saying that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> appreciate and it. like five minutes ago, she was telling yeah. us how old we were. So <laughs> We've redeemed ourselves. The sandwich method. Um, yeah. Supplement sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm, I'm going to get a knife hand. Um, all right, here we go. <laughs> So Chief Barrier, this is for you, being able to see the big picture, like you said earlier, more on the strategic um, peak. What, in your, in your viewpoint, what challenges or deficiencies do you think our airmen are facing uh, now that really you th may could hamper the ongoing efforts to enhance interoperability and being ready for GPC fight? Um, so I, I would really like to know, because you have a little bit of that advantage. Yeah, so so I'll, I'll alter it a little bit. So I always think the challenges are going to be resourcing and personnel, right? I think but that goes along with everything. Um, or the, yeah, but, but I, I don't necessarily look at the, the challenges and, and deficiencies. I, I kind of look at the opportunities that we have in front of us. You know, we have the opportunity to, to, to really talk about how we train our airmen and how we educate our airmen. Um, when we, so my previous experience to sit in the A4 seat was a career field manager for the two T1s. Um, ground transport, there we go, yeah, ground transportation folks. So, so getting to see you know, what our career field managers, um, spe specifically in the A4, what they're doing with our tech school folks, um, you know, the, the groups at the, the second 19th Air Force, you know, the things they're doing in terms of you know, tech training modernization, um, competency-based models, AR, VR, um, and really for the first time in a long time, taking a real hard look at, at the skills that our airmen need to be competitive for the, the challenges of tomorrow. You know, I always you know, kind of go back to the, to the 2T1 stuff. When, when I was a career field manager, I looked at you know, our CDCs that were really out of date. And, and the reason I knew they were out of date is when I went through tech school 24 years ago, <laughs> there was an image of a fuel pump wrapped with a wet rag. And uh, the, the task below was this is how you, you know, prevent vapor lock in an overheating vehicle. And you know, 20 something years later, I'm the CFM and I go to the schoolhouse and I see the image of the fuel pump wrapped in a wet rag. And, and I asked everybody how many people have ever done this. And I made it a point to ask it like 10 times and not one person had ever, you know, for fun or for need, wrapped a wet rag around a fuel pump. So you know, we, we dug into like, well, why do we teach it this way? And again, it, it was by no means a, a revolutionary thing, but you know, a common sense approach to asking what do our airmen really need? And again, it's really refreshing to know that you know, all of our career field managers in conjunction with you know, 2nd Air Force, 19 Air, Air Force, 19 Air Force, they're taking dramatic swings to improve upon how we train our airmen. You know, our, our 2F community, uh, Chief Brancato and the Fuels folks, they've done awesome stuff with the 82nd, 782nd out at, out at Shepard, and it's gonna benefit their airmen you know, for the challenges of tomorrow. And, and again, it's, it's, it's a bold step, and I think General Miller you know, kind of said it best, you know, a lot of people can say no, but we gotta find out the people that can say yes. Mm -hmm. And we have our teams at the A4 and our CFMs and FAMs and MFMs and everyone in the pipeline aggressively finding who can say yes. And, and we're making a lot of progress in that avenue. Um, you know, talking to the, to the education piece, you know, again, this isn't meant to be controversial by any stretch of the imagination, but I think sometimes when we start talking about threats, we, we turn, we become very myopic, right? And, but for good reason, you know, the, the threats in the Indo-PACOM region are, are very valid. Um, but I think sometimes we forget that we have other theaters with other threats. Um, and we always have to be cognizant because if we have a blind spot exposed, it's gonna take a long time to recover from that. And, and what I'm not doing is I'm not bringing problems without solutions. I think a lot of the stuff that's been done with the, or that will be done, you know, with the Airman Development Command, maybe we have a way to prioritize how we train and streamline how we train and, you know, get to the things that we need a little bit sooner versus later. 
and then how we're going to change with the GPC piece, how we're going to change how we uh, exercise and educate our airmen, I think that's going to be really beneficial for not just the fight that we have in front of us, but those tertiary threats, those gray area threats that are always on, you know, always on the cusp of, you know, coming across our bow. So, I mean, again, not looking at them as, 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 as deficiencies or challenges, but I think we're in a time where we have a lot of opportunities to shape how our Air Force operates moving forward. There you go. I love that. Well done. Chief Davis, um, let's pivot to you. Having had assignments all over the globe, uh, whether it's Asia, Europe, Middle East, you've been everywhere. Um, <laughs> that's great, that's, you, just world travel. Um, could you share a particular insight, however, to the team, um, how truly valuable our relationships are with our allies and partners that you've seen, um, that you found value in that? Yeah, I, you know, my very first assignment was in uh, uh, Okinawa, Japan, uh, and um, yeah, shout out Okinawa. And uh, I was an airman basic. I show up in my work center at the Air Mobility Squadron there. It was a support squadron. We had two S's back then. And uh, the local nationals, um, they are the ones who train me, right? So I was trained by the, the local nationals there uh, in the air freight terminal. Uh, and to this day, they are still key partners with us uh, in the en route system and the, and the GAMs there. Um, then I get an assignment to uh, Europe uh, in the en route system over there, and it's the exact same thing. I do uh, a tour in the air mobility division uh, there for USAFE, and then learn our partnerships with uh, overflight um, and dip clearances and who you call and talk to the Italians when you're gonna fly a C-130 with class nine on it. Like, you, you gotta have those relationships. When we were doing a lot of stuff uh, in Iraq, you had one country decided they weren't gonna give us uh, the corridors uh, for tankers uh, anymore. You, you realize real quickly that when TCC, uh, or the 618th now, sorry, I'm old, uh, was going to uh, have to kind of redesign and shift how we were gonna continue to sustain those fights, that that was gonna be problematic. So our international relationships with our, our partners and allies is, is vitally uh, important. Uh, you, you saw a couple years ago, we decided we were gonna do some things, and I'm being vague on purpose. Uh, we put a bunch of airplanes uh, at Ramstein, and the relationships internationally were important so we could do what we wanted to do as a nation with our allies. You, you, we can't do it alone, right? Uh, I think a lot of Americans think that, hey, we're America, we're the biggest dog on the porch, we can do what we want when we want. In some cases, that's true, but we cannot do it without our partners. We are uh, indebted to them in many ways, uh, as they are us, for sure. But it, it's, it's just key, right? We are where we are uh, globally uh, because of the partnerships that we have with them. Uh, in some places, right? I've been in some places, like all of us in this room, you're like, wouldn't go on vacation there. But we are there uh, temporarily uh, to be able to deter uh, a lot of things. Uh, but, you know, I've made a lot of great friends from different parts of the world, and we do it because uh, we have to. So hopefully that helps. Oh, yes, absolutely. Go Chief Guzman, uh, so if, just to share a story, I was at Insulik, command chief over there, and Chief Guzman was my command first sergeant in USAFE F Africa. I tell you what, um, epitome of first sergeant, and so I would like to know from his extensive experience in that background, uh, which we, at times we call our first sergeants the caregiver of our airmen, right? What attributes do you believe our warfighters must embody in order to successfully fill their, fulfill their role in, in its integrated deterrence yeah. to the GPC fight? That's a phenomenal question, and, and, I, and I, I thought about it, I, saw, I got a little preview of it, but I thought about it at length, and like, what do we have to bring to the fight, right? Um, with, with me, it starts with, uh, with discipline. Uh, you're not always gonna be motivated to wanna do something, to get after something. Uh, but you got to be, if you have discipline, you'll get up and do it. Uh, whether it's waking up in the morning and getting to the fitness center, to the gym, whether it's eating the right things when you, you know you have to, to, to eat clean, whether it's um, doing something at work that you might not enjoy, enjoy doing, but you know you have to, it has to get done. Somebody has to do it and you have to do it right. So discipline comes to mind, humility, because with humility comes the ability to uh, be receptive to feedback, right? And, and to take any kind of feedback, whether positive or negative, uh, and to put it into action. If you have to fix a process or refine it to make it better because you've got some feedback on it, or if you're doing a great job by all accounts, don't get too cocky and too big-headed. Uh, keep looking for ways to refine it. 
So humility is going to be huge. Uh, and I know we hit on it already, but relationships, relationships, relationships. We can't be transactional in our approach, with, whether it's with allies, whether it's with teammates in our own um, service or other services. And I'm at a joint base right now. Um, and I approach every conversation with humility, where I wanted to be able to listen to what they're bringing to me. And, I, and I'm looking beyond the, the fact that, hey, we're different services, et cetera. I'm here to solve problems and get to yes. I'm not here to, to give you the default mode no and, and to point to, well, we're, you're in the Army, I'm in the Air Force, we're different. No, how do we work together to get to yes? Um, and that comes with humility and being relationship focused versus transactional uh, with an approach. But I think those things, uh, I know I've been in the Air Force now, coming on 27 years, and I, and I always try to approach right. every situation with, uh, with humility, with relationships in, in mind, and, and focus in on that, and with discipline to do the hard things that nobody else wants to take on sometimes. Um, so those three things came to mind this morning as I was, you know, kind of bouncing around in my head. What are, you know, what are the three things that, that I think are going to be critical uh, day to day or, you know, downrange in any kind of uh, operation? Awesome, sir. Um, so hopefully you're okay with a little, a little bit of a little bit more time. So hopefully you're okay with a little uh, audible. So I'd yeah. like to ask this question um, with. The deliberate intentional change um, had to occur with reoptimizing our Department of the Air Force. What key aspects then of leadership do you know to be the utmost critical in order to help the organizational change um, that you, to succeed through this change? What are those leadership key aspects I think that is very important at this moment? We'll start with Rob. Why don't you start on that end? <laughs> I want to give him a, a time to breathe. Give him a breather? Get some water. Because he's you know? old, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably the oldest among you. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, so I, I, so I think one of the, 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 the biggest attributes is um, the open-mindedness of it all. Um, you know, when we, we move out yeah. on all things GPC, you know, some of these things have to be recognized as, as go-dos, right? Um, you know, a lot of these things aren't going to be open for relitigation. You know, we get in a direction from, from the top that says, hey, these are the things that we need to prioritize and these are the things we need to get after. Now, the, the other aspect of that is, you know, being transparent and being vocal when something doesn't look right. Um, again, this, we're, not, we're not asking anyone to, you know, just toe the, tump, toe the company line or, you know, pick the, you know, county option when we're trying to get after these things. We have so many well-intended, absolute experts in the field who know their business. Um, when we're identifying things that, hey, this doesn't jive, this doesn't, this doesn't make sense, versus saying, well, we're just not gonna do it, to, to Guzman's point, how yeah. do we get there? How do we get there? Um, because again, if we start to kind of detract from the direction we're going, it's gonna slow things down, not necessarily create infight, but we're gonna miss out on opportunities to progress where we need to. And the folks who are gonna wind up paying the price are gonna be our airmen. Um, because when the dust settles on all of these GPC projects and, you know, core, you know, efforts that we're trying to get after, a lot of us won't be wearing the uniform anymore, you know. So it's, it's of the utmost importance that we get it right um, or get it to that 80 percent solution and let that generation of airmen that, that we help prepare, they get over to the finish line. Um, because, again, this is, it's, it's a time of consequence. And we really can't foot stomp that one enough because this is a very important time in our Air Force history to make sure that we, we get it right. Absolutely. Chief Davis. Uh, I learned a phrase from one of my commanders years ago, and it's uh, attribute positive intent. And when you are in an organization and the organizations above you change, attribute positive intent. No one in this room comes to work and says, I'm going to try to screw up everything today. Uh, and I am uh, uh, the dumbest person and I'm going to make uh, all these mistakes, right? And a lot of times, I know the maintainers in the room don't do this, uh, but port dogs, we just gripe and think everybody above us is stupid. Yeah. But, but that's yeah. absolutely uh, uh, not the case. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we speak and act from our perspective and our perspective changes from our experience and our education, and that continues to change. But if you attribute positive intent and just go, hey, those, those folks uh, up there are smart, they're talented, they're experienced, they have more information than, than, than I do, uh, their perspective is different than I do, and then at the tactical level of leadership or wherever you are, you have to be transparent and present. You have to communicate what you know and communicate what you don't know and be out in front. So when the information first come out in our wing, they kept saying, hey, chief, what's going on? And I said, I don't know, because I don't know, right? I know what I know, and I don't know what I don't know, yeah. but I had to be present and say, 
hey, you have heard this and you've heard that. And today, uh, because of social media, there's a lot of challenging things. I, I lived in an Air Force where I had all the information, then I got to distribute it when I, when I was ready. Uh, now that's not the case, right? And I, I don't gripe about that. I, that's just the environment that we live in. But you have to be present. You have to be able to uh, um, be available to, so folks can ask you questions and transparent uh, with what you know. But attribute positive intent. Man, I wish I had learned that years ago yeah. uh, because it made me less angry. Uh, and <laughs> I, I could just go. Nobody's trying to steal your cheese. They're yeah, just, they're right. Yeah, like, better. hey, uh, they've got it all worked out. So yeah. attribute positive intent. Like if you write anything down from what, we, what I say, uh, uh, write that down. Brig uh, Brigadier General Doug Jackson uh, taught me that, so attribute well, positive intent. Yeah. That's awesome. Everybody means well, right? Uh, and we got to help them. Mo most, mostly. Yeah, mostly. Well, there, are, there are a few, you know. Bless their hearts. The, I like the to bottom see the, 10%, right? Something like, I try to exercise, and people make fun of me, like, you see the best in everybody sometimes. So I'm like, I know, I have to. That's Otherwise, I'll just, I'll just be a miserable human being who wakes up every day saying, well, everybody's out to get me, and they're trying yep. to steal my cheese, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you got to try to find the best and smile a little bit and move forward. Um, yep. Something else I noticed, is whenever we implement change in our organization, I saw this firsthand, and, and I mean, having grown up in the logistics community, uh, we find a better way of doing something, or we think is a better way of doing it. We try to refine a process. It saves time. It gives people their time back. It, it just makes the process easier, better for the customer. And some folks get really upset and worked up about it. And, you, and when you start asking why and getting to the root cause of the why are you so worked up about this, well, you're changing the way I'm used to doing it. I've been here X amount of years. Mm -hmm. I've been doing it this way for this many years. And now you're giving me something else to think about. And you're changing the process. And you're making it uncomfortable for me. Uh, so it's really about them. It's not about making the process better for the end customer, for the, everybody else that's coming along, and for the set of dynamics and, and challenges we're dealing with in today's environment, yeah. right? Um, so sometimes it's just that. It's just getting down to that root cause. Like, why are you so worked up about this? Is it, is it about the process, or is it about you and the way you've been doing it for the last, you name it, X amount of years? Uh, and you got to show folks grace in working through that. Uh, it's easy for me to just say, well, fine, we're just going to remove you from the, oper from the process. And say, you, you can't do that all the time, right? You have what you have, so you got to be able to be a good coach and show grace and coach them through it and, and find what they can bring to the table uh, that's going to make them a valuable part of the team. Such valuable nuggets. Listen, I know we joke about our age a lot, yeah. right? Because it's we, fun. We, it is. <laughs> you did that. Uh, I, I started Officially, it. somebody handed me a pair of readers this morning, <laughs> and I actually broke them out, and they used them to read my email. Because they saw me struggling on my phone reading work emails, and they were like, you need readers. <laughs> we and, remember and the where time. You, Kershaw, you here someplace? She's probably here someplace. But she handed me a pair of readers, like, here you go. You're struggling. <laughs> Uh, just give up, brother. We just still just, remember. just put him on. Share some, share some inside pool. We spent the first like 10 minutes or the, before we walked on stage just talking about injuries. Injuries. <laughs> like, we were so we had the most shoulders. Illnesses. Shoulder surgery a few weeks ago. Yeah. So do we, we, we ever imagine home? we'd be in our careers just yeah. doing this as chiefs, just talking about yeah. how bad we hurt every morning? But yes. Right, here but, we are. But here's the thing. That <laughs> Sleep <comes> apnea machines. <laughs> the pain, right? The pain comes with a lot of wisdom, experience, and so please know we, we do it in a jovial manner, but I'll be, I'm, I'm telling you, the years of extensive experience wisdom cannot be, uh, under, can, un, cannot be undermined, and so I really just appreciate the time and just having fun with you three. <laughs> so as we close, though, I, I would like to give you a moment to part some, some last minute, you know, or last ending comments to the team. Um, just. Any takeaways or parting words that you can say as we, honestly, for all of us, we came around the same time frame. And so as we transition into the next chapter, the what afterlife. are some of those gold <laughs> nuggets that you could share to all these uh, uh, inquisitive minds? And we'll start with Guzman now, so Rob can now I'll take a second, breather. And then Davis gets to go last. <laughs> well, like I mentioned before, this is my first LOA. I wish I would have came to these more often throughout my time in. Um, I'm approaching 27 years now in the service. Um, a lot of experience, you know, a lot of uh, experiences, good, bad, ugly, uh, highs and lows, et cetera. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I'm, recap I'm recapping my career as a logistician, as a material manager, as a first sergeant. And, uh, and what are the things that always stuck with me? Um, and I'm, I'm just to recap on the question here, but is, you know, 
people value, uh, and I know this in every organization I've been a part of, they value folks that shared knowledge, that, that, you know, that, that are not about themselves all the time, that are willing to share experiences, that are willing to share knowledge, that are, willing to, that are willing to build relationships and maintain those relationships, and that always see the bigger picture, right? They keep the bigger picture in mind, the, biggest, the bigger goal in mind for the organization, and they're not out for themselves, they're not out to, you know, for the next thing. They're not pursuing the next thing, they're pursuing the things in front of them right now. Uh, so whatever role you're given, whatever opportunity you're given, uh, you're focused in on that. You know, if you're a section chief, a flight chief, a squadron SEL, that is the priority right now, not the next thing. And share your knowledge, um, leave it better than you found it. Take ownership. That's the big one for me, is taking ownership of your AOR where you are right now. Um, I remember, you know, and I was, I was, we we're getting on our, on our folks about, you know, the, the simple metrics, the overdue evals, the overdue credit card bills, you name it. And I remember saying, you know, I was a flight chief, I I'll be danged that my squadron commander was gonna call me out for overdue whatever, overdue evals, overdue. Re I took ownership of that flight, of that section. We took ownership of it. Yeah. This is an us thing. It should never be up to the next person to fix our issues or to leave it better than we find. It's, it's on us to own it, uh, to share our knowledge, uh, to be good teammates, and, and to leave it better than we found it. So just take ownership. That's the biggest thing I always took with me, is take ownership, focus on relationships, and leave it better than you found it. Well done. Well, you've been a great teammate to me, so thank, thank you. Thank you. I try Chris to be. Matt. I try to thank be good you. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Chief Barrier. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll keep mine pretty quick. You know, as we you know have an abundance of information flowing our way, and we see a lot of the threat briefs, and we see a lot of the challenges on the horizon. I think it's important that we you know deliberately don't pass up the opportunity to tell our airmen. <clears throat> excuse me. And I mean our airmen, not just wearing uniforms, but but our civilian airmen, our total force airmen, our allies and partners. You know, the awesomeness of what they do and the impact mm -hmm. that they have on a global scale every day. And I think that's very, very true to our logistics, our big L logistics airmen, because none of this works without our airmen. And again, our, our big A airmen. And again, if we have the opportunity to say thank you, you're making an impact, we appreciate what you do, please do that. Um, it means a lot to the folks as they're going to be working through a lot of challenges in the near future, and it's going to pay dividends for us. Wow. Well, thank you for being the leader that you are, Rob. Thank uh, you. Wait, take us home, Chief Davis. Yeah, well, pressure. I have this red light blinking up here saying, <laughs> you're you know, fine, you're hurry fine. up, hurry up. It's lunchtime. Uh, That's just I, a suggestion. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you don't tell the chief what to do. Yeah. So, um, I told y'all. Uh, it went up now. Yeah, it's like, oh, yeah. you have more time. Do what you want. I will. Thank you. So, uh, I, I have been part of the logistics community for, you know, 29 years. Uh, I retire this summer. Uh, I still wear the port uh, patch and I, I will do it until I take this uniform off. I am very proud to be a port dog. Whoa. I love the logistics community. I love uh, maintainers uh, mostly uh, some days. <laughs> uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, but uh, what you do uh, absolutely matters. Um, it makes a difference uh, when there's earthquakes in other countries, when there's natural disasters. Uh, this community is going to be the ones that save lives and makes a difference. It's also going to bring, um, do uh, bad things to bad people when necessary. I'm proud of what you do. You make a difference. It matters. Never forget it. To those of you who are more senior in the room, remember you are a mentor to somebody. You might think you're just the same uh, as you were. Like, I just think I'm Cameron, the guy who had no stripes, but other people don't see me that way, and I, my wife reminds me of that. Remember to, uh, as you're climbing the ladder, to use one hand to climb and another one to bring somebody up with you. Mm -hmm. Never forget that. Because you are not where you are because of yourself. Somebody helped you, so make sure you help. Uh, others to climb and rise as you did. So thanks for the opportunity again. Enjoy yourself. Cool. Wow, and there you have it, folks. That's all for the Chief. Thank you. Thank you so much. You were great. Cool.